Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager, and I have a special guest. Thank you so much for being with our trusted leaders, Stacey Hunky. Oh my gosh, thank you. You know I love doing this. Oh, well, this is oh, great. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Stacy is the CEO and founder of Stacy Hunky Inc. Her client list is unbelievable. Everything from Microsoft to Milwaukee to McDonald's. Just put those 3Ms in there. Vanguard She's been on TEDx Fed and, and FedEx. We'll get a little rhyme going here. Um, Oracle and Boeing. She's brilliant, and she is an expert on communicating with influence. There's a lot of very interesting overlap in our work to building trusted leaders. But before we get there, Stacy has uh, she's author of a great book. We're going to talk about it, Influence Redefined. Be the leader you were meant to be Monday to Monday. Stacy, thanks so much for being here. Just for everybody, give us a little inside scoop on something we don't know about Stacy. Well, well, first, you can introduce me any day with that with that kind of introduction and enthusiasm. I think, you know, and, and some people know this and some people don't. You know this because we have a very similar background. Mm-hmm. I always share my upbringing really determines and shows the, the level of drive I have now running a company. And that is growing up on a farm like that's so ingrained in me. And it's kind of comical, David, because growing up the farm, I couldn't wait to get off because it was so much work. And then, you know, you, you decide to be an entrepreneur as if that's any easier. But that's maybe like a little nugget of just really the core of who I am and and what I've created over here. The farm girl from Wisconsin. And we've had you out to our farm and now you've grown grown an amazing business and it's been fun. We're a part of a, I guess people would say pretty elite or unique uh, group of entrepreneurs, a small group that I'm grateful that's where I got to know you. So let's move into this because you uh, work with some amazing folks and help them in amazing ways on communicating with influence. First of all, you know, let let's talk about I want to get into the book for a second because you've got this this model for uh communicating with influence and there are three drivers. You talk about feedback, deliberate practice and accountability. I'm going to jump to the bottom of that accountability because what we see a whole lot is people think they know what accountability is and they don't. I'll go into companies and say, "Oh, we got a value of accountability." And and then they'll be like, uh, I'll say, "Well, well, how do you hold people accountable here?" And they're like, "Well, you know, accountability stuff." They don't really know. So, what does this mean? Give us a little overview of the model in our short time together and then let's touch on a tip for accountability. Okay. So the model to just give your listeners, your followers a visual, I want them to imagine a triangle, right? And what David just talked about, feedback, deliberate practice, accountability, they sit around that triangle. And I really believe this is like a constant. Those three have to work together to drive influence Monday to Monday, which we we can get into that a little later. So to get to accountability, feedback, first of all, so many of the leaders that we mentor will say, we love you and you, we hate you. And when I ask them, well, well, let's go to the hate part first. And they're like, you're the first person that really tells us the truth. And so many times, you even get this probably with some of your clients, David, as you climb the ladder, if you ask, how did I do? Give me some feedback. We often Mm -hmm. hear, nice, good Mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. And, And they're not confident to tell you, well, you take too long to get to the point. It's hard to follow your message, whatever it is. So feedback is key first to get to accountability. Mm -hmm. You've got to make sure that the feedback is specific so you know what is working, what's not, what do I do to get there? Feedback is so critical. And I I just have to, yesterday I was listening to a podcast, Global Leadership Summit, Greg Rochelle was on and talking about how they built this, you know, they have massive positive influence, but a culture of feedback. It's so uncommon, yeah. especially in certain certain cultures. They have a, you know, it's a big nonprofit where sometimes people can kind of be nice. And we know about that even in Minnesota. It's great to be kind, but yes. kindness is also telling the truth and making this place where it's safe to give yeah. feedback that helps us be better. Yeah. 
And, and then that's half the problem, right? A lot of my clients will say, you're the, really the first that has ever given us constructive feedback. Well, then accountability, though, you, first you've got to have the deliberate practice. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm saying deliberate practice. I'm, I'm here in Chicago, and I always share the story about Michael Jordan. If, if you haven't seen his documentary, Last Dance, it's a good one to check out. And in the documentary, he says he did 1,000 shots a day, 6,000 a week. He goes on to say what gets rewarded in public gets practiced in private. Mm -hmm. No one is born as an influential leader. And, and you really, you have to make the shots in anything in life if you want to change behavior. Well, if you've got feedback and deliberate practice constantly driving each other, the accountability is the big piece of it. Your listeners, your followers, everyone around you can tell when you don't hold yourself accountable. And, and David, you and I both know that what doesn't get measured, nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. The accountability is not the work I do with individuals. I always say, I can't make your people do it. I can give them the tools. And the best way to hold yourself accountable in the work that I do is we talk a lot about recording yourself, similar to what we're, we're doing right here mm -hmm. together. Record yourself and start seeing yourself through the eyes and ears of your listeners. Listeners. But you have to do that on a weekly basis, especially initially to just understand and give yourself feedback. That's number one tip around accountability. The second, if you've got a friend who runs with you every morning and at 5 a.m. they are at your doorstep, you're going to put your feet on the floor as well. You're, you're not going to stay in bed. But if I don't have an accountability partner checking in with me on how I'm developing and around how I'm communicating, I'll never do it. So it's finding an accountability partner, maybe someone in your personal life and your professional life that will be honest with you, tell you the truth of what you want to be told, and then on a regular basis. And I think that's the piece where people don't, it's, you have to be accountable to even do those two accountability mm -hmm. steps. I think it's interesting. I think I read this. This was the uh, a big study by the Association of Talent Development, and they found uh, basically 10% of people that have goals accomplish them. Uh, yeah. Of those that have goals with an accountability partner that they meet with at a specific time, it jumps up to 95%. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I and totally with, believe it. Yeah. And we, and we can track that. You know, I, I've shared with you before that we do research. We partner with the Social Research Lab. I know you, you've worked with them too before out of Northern Col University of Northern Colorado. And the research that we sh showed or proved through that was exactly the same thing. If we had the leader of the team that we were training go through our workshop and we would check six months to a year after, the accountability was still there. If the leader didn't go through the training that would drop almost 50%. Half of the group was still working on what we recommended, the other half. When we went back to ask what, they're saying, well, no one really, I had no one to report into. I had no one hold myself accountable. Now I can push back on that because you're still, you're, you're the one that can only hold yourself accountable. But we get, life gets in the way, things get in the way. And when I'm saying accountability partners, the best people, <laughs> to tell you the truth, are people in your personal life. Mm -hmm. Hey, we've all been spending two years with our families, perhaps very in close quarters, we've created our only our only we work sessions, right? A co co sharing space, asking them to give you that honest feedback, but to do it in the moment, though, too, David. You know, the, the, if if you and I were just on this call, and I wanted you to give me feedback, you're my accountability partner. I would say to you, here's what I want to work on. Would you jump in every time I go off track? Hmm. And that just takes feedback to interactive coaching is what I refer to. That takes it to a whole new level. Here's what I want to work on. Hey, can you help me with this? I could see yeah. that working. I could see that telling my teenagers that and saying, hey, you guys help me with this. <laughs> and they will love. They, they're happy to help. <laughs> yeah. And that's where I love family members, friends, because they can give you feedback in the moment. Now, if it is something like this call where you really cannot or I can't interactively coach you during this recording, before we hopped on, we could have said to each other, all right, here's what I'm working on. Would you watch and listen for that? And then after the recording, let's just take two minutes. I'm not asking mm -hmm. people to carve out more time in their day. You're, you're talking all the time anyway. Now just put strategy, put purpose around every interaction that you have. At Trust Edge Leadership Institute, we know how difficult it can be to lead a company through change and how debilitating the last couple of years have been to teams. Based on decades of research, we know that to carve the path forward for your people, you need trust. Trust is the key to reignite your company culture. 
Trust is what will grow your bottom line and you can't do it alone. What if you could come together with hundreds of leaders from around the world to increase connection, capacity, and also bottom line impact? That's why the Trusted Leader Summit exists. At the summit, you'll surround yourself with C-suite leaders, meet Olympic gold medalists, connect with high performers, and gain tools from global industry experts that you can implement right away to reignite your people. Join us April 12 through 14 at the Mall of America, JW Marriott. If you lead anyone, if trust and integrity matters to you, if you want a high-performing culture, this summit is for you. Get your tickets at trustedleadersummit.com today, and we can't wait to see you there. There's a whole lot more here. I love the framework. The book is called Influence Redefined. We're going to put all this in the show notes, Trusted Leaders. Uh, trustedleadershow.com. Trusted Leader Show, I almost said trustedleadersummit.com. That's coming up. Our summit is coming up quickly. And um, But trustedleadershow.com, we'll put all the show notes and uh, where they can find out about you. Before we uh, move too far from this thought, though, I want to jump over to something that people are talking a lot about today, and that is how do I just build influence, especially virtually? I mean, we still have people uh, that are going to be in virtual for a long time. How? What? Or, or maybe you? I, I know you've written on and talked about what are the mistakes people are making as they try to build influence virtually. How or much in time do you? Yeah, let's yeah. go. How much <laughs> time us, do you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and and it's it's more. <laughs> We don't realize, I think we have forgotten, David, that this is still work. Yeah. You're still building a personal brand. And you'd be shocked the amount of people that I'm working with that will show up and I'm thinking, would you ever have a conference room in your bedroom? Come on. You've, you've had two years. <laughs> you've yeah. got to make a change. So the first thing that my team and I did when this all went down and we went into lockdown, I said to them, we're going to brainstorm. What do we do in person? What is the experience our clients have with us in person? And how can we build that experience here as well? So I want people to just take a step back and think about how do you interact with in person? You maybe look people dead in the eyes. Maybe you use gestures. You don't use gestures. If you just think about how you behave in person, the idea is how you create influence virtual is to give your listener the feeling as if you're sitting in the same room with them. So I'm going to give you just one tip. You notice how much of me you can see today. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll just mess around here a little bit. I have a stand-up desk, but I always tease individuals, David, because I'm like, why would you put your head on a, you would never sit this way, right? So it's it's the, it's the small things like if your camera is not set up where it's eye level and you just lock and load with that listener, everything else is going to go out the window. For those and, that aren't watching, you're just listening. You just get, when she looks great when she's got the camera at eye level, and you're seeing about. A little more of you is what you're showing so that you can have arm gestures and you're yeah. backed up just slightly. See what I'm doing. But, but you're not looking down at the camera. You're not looking up at it. You're looking eye level. Perfect. Yeah. Or you're not spending the time with your monitor or as if people can't tell you're checking email. Mm -hmm. I'll have the, the email from their laptop will reflect off their glasses, David. I'm like, come on, I see what you're doing. So I think we just need to take a step back and say, every way we behave in person, it needs to be here too. Because if you mess with this and how you connect and you engage with people and your level of energy or lack of energy, and then you're in person and people are like, whoa, you're two different people. Now you start to impact the trust. So the biggest mistakes is the setup, David, the lack of brevity. I, I'd like to raise the question of, do you, we have, we have Zoom fatigue because meetings are ineffective. I think that's what's causing Zoom fatigue. And, and, and don't be the one <laughs> that leads an ineffective meeting. The eyes is the big one where we just, we, we don't know where to look. And we're having conversations with everyone else besides who we're supposed to connect with. So you miss reading your listeners. Hmm. So it's the, the brevity is the big one. Anything else to having engaging, to engaging people online, how to, to, to increase my influence. You've got a lot of ideas. What are some others? Like what we're doing. You talk, let them talk. I am big with open-ended questions. And I always tell anyone that if people aren't used to me and we're, we're getting on a, a team sales pitch, for example, sales call, and within the first two minutes, I'm calling someone out because I want them to feel like, whoa, okay, she's not going to just lecture to us and give her our pitch, but she is really going to make us do the majority of the talking. What's and a favorite the, question? What, it, what is your biggest challenge that you're seeing your listeners are experiencing in this virtual space? 
And then after you ask that question, David, you learn to outpause everyone on that call <laughs> because someone will get uncomfortable and start. And, and what you're doing, you're creating the behavior, right? How we show up, every interaction will either enhance or jeopardize the reputation we're trying to create. The good news is every interaction is an opportunity to practice what do you want to improve because we're here so often throughout the day. The interaction, though, is the key. Is And I'm not saying go into your chat. I'm saying, talk to people, call them out. David, what's your thought around this process? How should we move forward? Hmm. Because if you do it with one person, <laughs> suddenly everyone else on the call is thinking, shiny object. I am next. <laughs> There's a good chance I'm going to be called on. And it's magic how it works. Well, you, you said something uh, before we talked about this that there's, or I want you to get at this for our listeners, why most people believe they have more influence than they actually have. It goes back to the feedback. And so many times individuals will say to me, well, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been in this position for a long time. I, I communicate every day. When I know what to say, I, I, I feel confident. Title and our feeling doesn't guarantee the level of influence that we have. I've, I've worked with CEOs whose assistants are more influential than they are. And keep in mind, you know, your CEO gets that point and no one really gives them constructive feedback anymore. We go off of feeling rather than fact. And this whole idea of, you know, re recording yourself on your phone, this is fact. This is the eyes and ears of your listeners. And David, I still think this is more powerful than you and I seeing each other on screen. Mm -hmm. or when people are on Zoom, that there's still something about seeing yourself in action. So the why we think we're more influential, we're not getting the feedback we need. We, we never practice. I mean, when was the last thing, time you really thought about, oh, wonder what my, my hands are doing, wonder what my eyes are doing. We, most of the time, we don't think that way. And if we're doing Zoom after Zoom, it's, I've got to get this meeting out. I've got to cram this information down their throat. Good, I'm on to the next one. And the second is we, we just, we're not seeing ourselves on, through the eyes and ears of our listeners. We're just not doing the accountability behind judging how much, te not judging, really measuring how much influence we really have. So we need an accountability partner. We need to get feedback. How do we do this? You talk a lot in other scenarios or other settings I've heard you on this Monday to Monday. It's part of who you are and your company yeah. is this consistency piece. Of course, the eighth pillar of trust is consistency. We call it the queen and king of the pillars. Talk to me about this idea of Monday to Monday. Yeah, we do. You and I have so much crossover. We, we've talked about this be, before, and I, I reference to your material often because this idea of trust. So it ties also to Monday to Monday. It's twofold. How you experience me here, David, and, and you've been with me in person, is pretty much how I am in person, correct? I mean, I'm not, yes. I'm not trying to be something different here than when I'm in person. So now with all the mediums, virtual, in-person, hybrid, and, and how I define hybrid, you're talking to a live audience and people virtually all at the same time, right? Or you're hanging out with friends and family versus with coworkers. There's this level of... You can't be all distracted with your family all weekend long, and then suddenly Monday morning you've got a Zoom call and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to be a different person. That's what I mean. And, and I'm not saying you have to be perfect, a perfect communicator. Be conscious of how do you show up? Is your brand consistent, or do people have to guess who's going to show up? Camera on, camera off, in person, not in person. That's one side of it. The other side of Monday to Monday is, again, the behavior. So how I behave is always consistent every day of the week. So I want you to th think like, let's go back to Michael Jordan, or you could take a, a, a golf, for example. Why do you think golf is so hard? If you don't hold yourself accountable and practice every core element to that skill of golf, and however a golfer practices Monday through Friday is how they're going to perform on Saturday. I mean, so relevant now, if anyone's watching the Olympics, imagine the hours these folks have put in. The difference between us and an Olympian every day in the corporate world is game day because your name is on everything that you do. The good news is every time you turn that camera on, every time you, you interact with someone, you've got an opportunity to practice and just think about how are you coming across? until you form the new behavior that you want to put your name onto it. 
One, one more tip here on influence. We're all trying to influence. We have our own reasons. We want to influence because we care about a mission. We care about the difference we make. We care about changing the world. We care about raising good kids. We care about, well, we all know why influence, you know, we want to be influential, hopefully for good. What's another tip? How, how can we be a little bit better at influencing in our space? The other one we really haven't talked about, because we've talked a lot about behavior, let's just switch to messaging because I define influence, body language and messaging, they're consistent Monday to Monday. From a messaging standpoint, I talk a lot about identifying your listeners' why. Why should they care? Why did, why did they come on a call with you? Why is this important to them? And how many times do we get on meetings and they start this way? Thanks for coming on, coming on the meeting. I know you guys are all busy. What I would like to talk about today is I believe, I think, here's what I think we should do. So much of our conversation is us focused versus let's take a step back and focus on your listeners' why first. How you do that throughout the conversation and this is also part of trust, using that pause, not just to communicate with brevity, but using that pause to constantly adapt your message on the fly. I mean, I'm giving you an example. I'm, I'm working with a comedian right now, just as, as, as a coach and, and helping me, right? So he's on like the big stages. We were coaching last week and he said, he goes, you know, comedians, what they call the pause. They say it's pause for the cause. He said, when a comedian pauses, they're doing it on purpose, right? Because it's right after a punchline and that gives your audience the experience of the laughter. That, that's why we watch comedians, for the experience. He said, if a comedian doesn't pause after that punchline, they now are stepping on the laughter. Mm -hmm. And I came back and said to him, Dave, and I'm like, ah, oh. I go, that's what I'm talking to my clients. Don't step on your ideas. And don't step on your listeners' ideas. And that's what happens if we constantly are going and talking a mile a minute. And really honoring that silence so that when you're silent, you're listening for what is really important to these folks. What do I need to say? How can I adapt my message on the fly to make sure that they feel like I'm communicating with empathy, listening to what's important to them, to get them to the solution that's going to influence that action? Love it. And, and that's a lot of focus, right? I mean, we, we just don't, we want to do all the talking. I always encourage you to take about 25% out of that conversation, put it into their lap. And it's so much easier too, because you're busy just absorbing everything that they're saying to help let your listener help you create your conversation on the fly. This is a critical, you know, we talk about this with our, with our trust edge facilitators or partners, like every time we're talking about anything, whether it's the case for trust or the pillars or whatever, every, at the end of every section, we're thinking, okay, so what does this mean to them? Because yeah. that, that reframes how we teach or train or equip or coach or consult on anything. What does this mean to them? So right. I, I love this idea of getting pausing and looking back. Uh, I love two sides of this, of course, the pause for the cause, but this starting with what's the, what's the, what do they want? Because we can, you know, we can't give what they want if we don't even know, right? Yeah. We don't pause and think about it instead of yeah. just giving what we want. So great ideas here. Stacy. where can people find out more about you? Right on our website. And there's all of our social media handlers handles so that we are always com constantly pushing resources out there. So you can latch on to whatever you need. Go to our website, Stacy with an E-Y, H-A-N-K-E-I-N-C.com. Perfect. And there's a load of complimentary content that you give away and a load of ways you help people to want to be more influential on the stage as coaches, as sales leaders. Final question. We, it's, oh, it's the Trusted Leader Show, so we always end with this. Who is a leader you trust and why? I know you might not be expecting this. My dad. I mean, truly my dad. And, and, and I, I reflect back to the, the little things that he would give to my sisters and I growing up when he said it, I thought, this is crazy. What is this going to do in my life, right? And a lot of it was, he would always say, follow through. If you follow through on what you said you're going to do, you'll be the top 1%. And I remember hearing that thinking, well, that's not hard. Or he would always, and that came through with everything, right? So follow through. The other thing that he always said, just such common sense that we all need today, especially, he always said, be kind no matter who it is. Hmm. And when I was in grade school, he always said, be kind of the janitor. Did you say hello to the janitor today? 
Hmm. And it's, it's those, I think it's just the little things in life that if these last two years have proven anything, it's go back to your basics, but commit to it and just be consistent by figuring out how do you want others to perceive you? Love it. And then you'll, you'll figure out the level of influence you have or what you need to do to have more influence if that's the case. My dad too. We talk about it all the time. Yeah. And my mom, I, you know, just what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I shouldn't leave my mom out, my, right? For, but my I, mom I, well, we both do. <laughs> my mom used to say, go the extra mile. Other people don't go there. Anybody can do it halfway. Go the extra mile. So yeah. anyway, well, you can see all the show notes at trustedleadershow.com. This has been a treat, Stacy, to have you on. And I just thank you. Thanks for being my friend. Thanks for being such a, an influential leader in this world to so many. This has been the Trusted Leader Show. Until next time. Stay trusted.